top climate scientists in the world uh, to speak to you. Uh, Willie Soon will talk about sun and uh, David Legates will talk about water and uh, Pat Michaels will talk about uh, policy. And uh, Willie Soon is going to lead off. Willie is an astrophysicist. He is at the Harvard Smithsonian uh, Center for Astrophysics. Uh, his most famous book in my mind is The Maunder Minimum and The uh, Sun-Earth uh, Variable uh, Connection. Willie now <clears throat> may be <clears throat> excuse me, the most famous uh, climate scientist in the world because certainly uh, he has been beaten about the head and shoulders more than any other scientist for his honesty in science in all his papers. And you've read uh, a lot about how uh, the other side has tried to uh, disparage a, an honest uh, scientist. Uh, I, I call that uh, a topic that I'm going to talk about in the next panel called Lysenkoism. If you have not uh, heard of it, uh, look it up. Uh, look it up in a dictionary or Google, and you'll see that it's going on uh, here in the United States. So, uh, with no further ado, I present to you Willie Soon. All right. Good morning, everyone, and. Uh... Greetings to everyone who is uh, friendly on science and uh, not so friendly on politics. So, <laughs> I'm here to try to speak on science. My job today is fairly simple. The first things that I want to do is to have a shout out to, well, let's start with this, this graph. I want to talk about how the sun is connected to the, to the, to the earth uh, climate, specifically the temperature. We have seen a seen, look at this kind of graph for a long time. I wonder, Actually, what is plotted there, which is actually supposedly a global temperature from all the meteorological stations available, that's showing this warming and then sort of a plateau and then rise again. My specific focus today is I try to tell you that we are actually questioning these particular end parts of the rise, whether those things are actually related to climate at all. Is it something related to non-climatic factors, maybe like urbanization? of the station itself or maybe something to do with the time of observation where those data or when those data are taken, so on and so forth. My job is made very, very simple now because I have these two excellent colleagues which I want to give a shout out. They are sitting at the back, Ronan and Michael Connollys. They are chemists, they are volunteers essentially from Ireland and we have a new and exciting result to share with you today, mainly to try to show you that this temperature curve, especially the warming trend at the end, not supposed to be really warming up that way, so you're supposed to have a trend that from the 1930s and 40s coming up and then just similar height. We'll show you that. And then I will also try to make sure that you wake up tonight dreaming about sunspots. So I'll talk about suns. <laughs> so we will start with something simple and I'm gonna also shout out to the the Connollys where we have our posters presentation out there, so if you have the free time to try to explore in more details, obviously 15 minutes will not do justice to all the details that we put into this work. So we have a lot of uh, information out there, so please stop by and say hello to all of us. I'm going to try to examine the Northern Hemisphere temperature records by looking at those specific areas. The Arctic Circle, we mentioned uh, U.S. station, so for example, if you want to deal with the urban heat island effect, isn't that a good idea that maybe we'll just take a look at the first cut? What does the rural station really say? The same thing in Ireland. Obviously, Ireland is, uh, is somewhat uh, not so populated area. In that particular station we have, it's considered a rural station. It's one of the long records that we have. And then in China, it's heavy, heavily urbanized, but then we're going to try our best to look at the available rural uh, station information and then of course to talk about how you can actually co co correct for some of the problem from uh, urbanization heat effects. So for US temperature, please don't read into this graph, it's a bit too small. I only want to quickly go over what we have. We clearly have some other issue that is known to be non-climatic effect which is exactly what time you take the, the, the temperature. So that's a correction for it and we account for that. That's also introduced by NOAA. So we, we actually follow their procedure very carefully and then we've done one additional correction so we come up with a temperature record. And in US we probably have the best record in the world in terms of available coverage and the number of stations available for the rural station. So this is a very robust result. 
I hope you notice that the end point of this temperature rise doesn't look like those things that are being promoted by, let's say, IPCC or even NASA uh, Goddard Institute for Space Study record. Then we have island. You can see again, you have a temperature curve, and the station that we have here is from Valencia Observatory. My two dear colleagues have actually went through very details about looking at the, the metadata in the sense that all the information about the changes to the environment around the, 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 the taking of the data around that area, including the station shift from one area maybe 50 feet away to more inland and that sort of thing. So a lot of details went into this work to make sure that we have the highest quality uh, thermometer data to study. Because after all, if you want to study sun climate, you better make sure that you know the best sun data to study, to use, and the best climatic data to use. For US, for, for China station, just focus on the top three graph. We show you basically from the available station, which very, uh, with high number of station around for the rural station at the top, it show you the trend is a bit, actually three times lesser than the fully urbanized area in China from 1950 to about 1990 or so. This is one way in which that we go about trying to correct for the, using the urban data, correct for the, the sharp trend caused by the non-climatic effects. So I hope you all get the point, right? You see the, the urbanized uh, station area is actually very, very uh, uh, high warming rate compared to actually the rural station and then of course the intermediate type of, uh, of, uh, of, of station in the sense that we have to also use all some of the information available because truly rural uh, station is very, very few of them around. So we need to get all the information we can and then try to see what we can come up with. This is what we got for China, so the top, just focus on the top graph so you can see that again, you have a, almost like a multi-decadal kind of a modulation that you can see available in, in the record that we, we best come up with. And then for the Arctic, this is the only one of the really hard problem that is a bit unsolved. We essentially take all the available station that is plotted at the bottom, and we do our best. Arctic, as you know, is not so much population, so they have a different kind of problem. Their the kind of problem is a bit like, uh, you know, in Greenland, you, in the 1900, maybe 20% of the people live in the, the big city. And then by now, I mean, the 80 or 90% of the people live in the, you know, big city. So it's that kind of effect that it's a bit hard to get out. The, the main problem in all of this problem is actually we don't have uh, information, which actually is supposed to be the job of NOAA and NASA GIS and all those people that use the taxpayer money. They're supposed to give us those information. We kind of don't have those information. So we really need the, the station history, all these other details that we need in order to really better come up with the, what is the real temperature is actually telling us, especially for interpreting climate change, okay? So for, for Arctic, you see this is what we come up with. The end is a little bit higher. That is the part that we don't know how to correct, but we strongly suspect that part of the trend is actually has some, some non-climatic factor in it that caused the trend to go a little bit higher than actually the first rise, okay? Just to tell you. So that's what we're trying to say that we're doing our best. So if you put all that four together, you average them, you will come up with the bottom curve, which is what we call the Northern Hemisphere Composite. Now I enlarge it for you to see. So can we see anything that warming at the end like the way that they show it? We really think that this, this information, that uh, this composite record that we come up with is very high quality. It's one of the first attempts, I guess, to try to do this work very carefully by the way, we also have a working manuscript now, so we, we hope for any criticism and any amount of uh, criticism that you can offer or comments will be very helpful. So this is just to compare with what they produce in terms of the Northern Hemisphere average. Remember, we have another problem, right? Southern Hemisphere. What about Southern Hemisphere? It's an easy question. Why don't we get that too? Oh, that's not much data around, and most of it is covered by ocean, and then the sea surface temperature problem is another class of problem that Seriously, by now, we really should work on it carefully and see what best we can, okay? I'm just trying to give you a caution of how complicated the whole problem is. So you can, if you compare what is produced by NASA GIS in terms of Northern Hemisphere, you can see they have that feature that is quite different from what we produce, okay? But the, the real question is like, who's right, isn't it? So I tell you, this is what we're going to do. We're going to try to find, is there any independent support at all for the correctness of this new Northern Hemisphere Composite Record. Actually, we first test. Let's use the IPCC couple model uh, simulation output. This is the model, uh, complex computer models that are supposed to simulate what the climate is doing for the past 150 years or so. So we take their, their, their model outputs, 
now maybe like 20 or 24 of those models, and then you average those model output that included so-called natural forcing, which is the sun and the volcano, and then the anthropogenic forcing, which means the CO2, the aerosols, and so on and so forth. You can see that it doesn't quite fit our records. Even if you use only natural forcing, it doesn't fit. And even the CO2, ah, okay, only the end part. You know, so it's not as good as you imagine. But if you compare, this is the part where I think is most surprised to most people, including the expert in the, in the room here, which is if you look at the Northern Hemisphere sea surface temperature record available that actually try their best to account for the systematic biases and all the uncertainties, which is plotted as this blue shaded uh, range, uh, you can see that our record actually compared not so bad at all, especially if you look at in terms of the rescale result, which means the land temperature, as you see, is mostly land, so it has a much higher variability. So if you scale it by a factor of half compared to the sea surface temperature, look, you don't have the high end. This is actually the most surprising part. The high end is probably caused by the Southern Ocean sea surface temperature, actually. Okay? So I say that this is one of the very good independent validation of, of, of what we have, what we produce is reasonable. We're not saying we are correct. Another one that is very interesting, this is a very surprising result also. If you look at the available place, uh, uh, paleo, which means the study of the past record using all these indirect measurements like the glaciers movement, the length of the glaciers, so on and so forth, you can see that actually our record is not so bad at all compared to this information from the paleo record. Okay? And the bottom part basically show you the, the distribution of those glacial data that, that is taken by these two authors, the Olemans from, from Holland. And here is another one from Three Rings, which is another surprise. If you look at what they produce, they actually don't have this high warming end at the end, the, the Three Ring records. And then if you compare with our record, I wouldn't say we do it that, that as well, except that you can see the Three Ring records because it's more sensitive to year-to-year -year changes or even 10 year to 10 year but they're not very good at capturing something that is like every 50 years, every 60 years kind of changes. So they have very underestimated the changes a little bit, but it's not so bad compared to our results in that sense. So I guess it's all darkness. Now we're going to have a little sunshine. So let's look at this record again. So the question is, so what? How does the sun look? What is the best record of the sun? Which I will also spend a lot of my time explaining this. This is what we can put on the, 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 the relationship. The red curve now is actually the best, what, what are we considered the best estimate of the solar irradiant changes of the sun over this same period. Okay? And uh, the blue curve obviously is the best composite record that we produce. I have worked on this topic for close to 25 years. I have to tell you honestly that I don't expect to see this record, this, the way it looks like this actually. It's a bit of a surprise also for myself. It clearly shows you that I'm not intending to only find this sort of answer. All my life, I only wanted to learn what is true and what can be wrong and so on and so forth. It's a form of satisfaction, internal satisfaction, rather than try to tell people this and that to be you know, correct or wrong in terms of this political noise that they're creating. So this is the kind of, uh, I guess, the, the, the only... <laughs> Benefit that you get for, for studying science very carefully. So you turn into a McDonald person. By the way, that person that produced this thing is outside the, the hall. I'm glad that they didn't let him in. But, <laughs> but he hide his identity, and then he taped a lot of my conversation with him, and then turned into, actually, if you talk about conflict of interest, he should declare his conflict of interest. I mean, he's now working full time with these desmog blocks and so on and so forth. Anyway, I'm not going to waste time on them, so let me move on. I'm going to attack, I'm going to try to answer some of the criticism on my work. The most obvious one is the Sun fallacy in court. It's done by actually this person by the name of uh, Dr. Gavin Schmidt from NASA Goddard Institute for Space Study. He's now actually the director. And the kind of statement he's made, maybe I don't need to repeat, but just remember that all my works are pointless. So there's no point in my work. Okay, and of course, singularly poor, that sort of thing. And then of course, I am very sorry for Hartland that you're called, they call you a pseudo-climate conferences. So remember, you, you just tell people we're not coming to the real climate conferences, we're going to pseudo-climate conferences. <laughs> so this is the way that uh, Gavin Schmidt attacked my work. He produced a, a plot that I have produced, which is actually the iridance estimate that I show. Okay, the same one that I used just now. And the Arctic temperature curve that I produced before. It looks like a good correlation, so in 2005 I wrote up the thing. So I showed that curve, and then he showed that the bottom one is that, that curve. 
I want to tell you that that result at the bottom is wrong. So the first question to ask Gavin is that, what happened to the Arctic temperature? Here, it's a bit complicated to explain, but I have published this result. The bottom, bottom part of the, the curve, which is a diamond point, it doesn't change, and then the top, they shift it down, and then so that this thing can go up a little bit higher. So I would say the question is, if you, you produce this result, you better tell us why this one bias with no explanation in, in, in existing publication. I'm going a little bit quicker. Now about the, the solar irradiance estimates. I say that we're going to use that one at the top, and then this is what Gavin is using. I want to tell you that what happened in that record that Gavin is proposing. All the record, if you look carefully, and then you correlate the so-called irradiance, the sunlight output, with actually sunspot record. You can see that they are basically a, a version of the sunspot record. But I'm trying to tell you that if you want to study the sun, click this uh, video, please. You really need to know details about sunspot. Guys? Sunspot, please, dream about sunspot tonight. It has so many different types. In fact, close to 60 different types of sunspot you can categorize. What I want to focus you on is that the big, deep part is called umbra, which is vertical magnetic field. They're cool, very cool region. And then penumbra is actually a few line coming as an angle, okay, penumbra. If you look at the history of the record, it's actually the size of the sunspot very, very important. If you look at the sunspot area that is greater than 100 units, 100 units here, home, you can imagine it like the size of the Earth is 169, okay? If you look at the, the large one, nothing happened. If you look at the less than 100, the smaller sunspot, which is a lot of them, okay? You can see that actually there are some hint of a circular changes, which is the multi-decadal part of it. I'm being blank now, but I'm going to cool off and give you another four minutes. Thank you. So the answer to that is that if you look at the literature, which of course Gavin Schmidt didn't bother to find out, this is widely available and well known. If you look at this information, they tell you that it's so important to really understand the structure of the sunspots, you know, dynamics, which is actually what is missing from what we study so far. Okay? And I give you an evidence. That's basically what has been known since 1979. I'm only sticking to science. Unless you have something to counter this result, I'm willing to say we are wrong. But so far, I think that this is the best record to use. Quickly, just to mention my workplace is to present to you Professor Samuel Langley. He's the third secretary of the Smithsonian and the founder of the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory where I work. Okay? And the reason I want to point to that is that this man wants to study the radiation of the sun. He even went to the extent to measure actually the light output from Cuban firefly like this. If you can see what he said long ago, that the, he talked about this basic, the most important and difficult problem in astro, astronomical physics, that this will be a fundamental problem for meteorology to estimate the amount of radiation coming out from the sun. Okay? And then if you follow on with the, the, the next secretary, which is uh, Charles Greeley Abbott, by the way, lived up to 101 years old, and he said that this problem has been the problem for over 60 years. He showed you how difficult this problem is. And I'm merely standing upon the shoulder of these giants to try to learn a little bit more, propagate the knowledge positively, rather than trying to go backwards and then with all the names calling. This is the way that these people are actually treating people when they die. Okay? Calling Professor Robert Jastrow, Professor uh, Fred Seitz, and Bill Nuremberg to be some kind of a strident abuser of science. These are actually giants of science, in my humble opinion. 
And I happen to be very proud. Oh, okay, somehow the picture didn't show up, but I think this quote from my co-author, Ronan Connolly, is very useful to remember. It is not so much that they refuse to acknowledge the existence of the long-scale TSI, but they have gone out their way to find reason to dismiss this thing. Somehow this CO2 thing really drives them mad in some sense, which I don't understand why they're supposed to grow more hair. <laughs> so, Professor Jastro and uh, Fred Sy, I, ha I happen to be a very lucky young person to be able to attend their, his 90th birthday. This is truly a scientific giant. By the way, for those who don't know Professor Fred Sy, tonight you will hear more about him. He's a former president of the National Academy of Science and so on and so forth. This man, I mean, your solid state physics, or the textbook, is basically invented by people like that with Eugene Wigner from Princeton. So these are the people. So when they attack people like us, I would say, pardon my French, they sue really soon. So I thank you because I run out of time. I truly apologize for being running out of time. Thank you.